So we're going to talk today about the power of personal witness, and really it's the power of your witness. And um, I have a wonderful group of friends, and I have a friend, they're a married couple, and they're my age, and they have eight children, okay? And their daughter, number seven of eight, is five years old, and she is everything that I want to be when I grow up. Can I just tell you that right now? She lives out loud. That girl lives in four dimensions. She's just a beautiful, beautiful little girl, and I absolutely love her. I've been telling this story lately to audiences. And so the mom was telling me this story, and she said, you know, sister, when you've been married for a long time, Sometimes in your communication with your spouse, well, she's like, you wouldn't know this because your spouse is perfect, but whatever, okay? So she said, sometimes, sometimes in communication with your spouse, you have some things that you could say in certain situations, but that probably wouldn't be very helpful, okay? So she's like, you just have to learn, like, how do you navigate conversations that are difficult? So she told me the story. She said that her husband during Christmas break, decided that he wanted to tear down their old play structure in their backyard. They affectionately called it the death trap, okay? So he wanted to tear down the play structure in the backyard, and he wanted to build his kids a really awesome play structure. So my friend was thinking, we'll go to Ikea, we'll get like a prefab thing, you know, it'll be over in a day or two. Oh, no, 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 no. Her husband was like, we're going to go big or go home. He went to Home Depot, got raw treated lumber, he got brackets, he got screws, and this was a dad on a mission to make a play structure that would last until 2075, pretty much, okay? So he enlisted the two oldest teenage boys who were really excited to do that for Christmas break. So he enlisted the two teenage boys, and they were out in the backyard building a massive play structure for the younger kids. So my friend said, day one went by, fine. Day two, day three... Day four, it is day five, it's day six now. She hasn't seen her husband in six days, okay? The teenage boys are beyond disgruntled over the fact they just spent six days building a play structure for their little siblings, okay? And she said, and now it's dinner at the end of day six, and she hasn't seen her husband, and um, he's been called into dinner twice already, so this is the third time, and she's getting just a little irritated, okay? So she's like, I love my husband very much, and he's a wonderful man, but I just, all I need is for him to come into dinner, okay? Like, just kids are throwing bread at each other. It's like total chaos in our house. We just want him to come to dinner. So he knows he's been called to dinner twice. This is three times. He knows that he's been outside for six days. Okay, so can you see what's about to happen? So she said, I went outside. We're going to call him in for dinner for the third, maybe fourth time. So she's like, I took my little girl, my little five-year-old. She's like, I took my little girl out into the backyard to call him in for the last time. She said, and I know, I know usually we've been married a long time. I usually know how these conversations go. <laughs> so, so we went outside and we opened the back door and she said, I saw my husband on the third floor of the play structure, okay? We're talking three stories on the three story. She's like, I saw my husband on the third, the third floor of this play structure, and we walked outside. And as soon as they walked outside, her husband heard the back door open, and he sees them, and she can see on his face he's anxious, he's tense, he knows, okay? I know that I've been called into dinner, I know, but I'm trying to get this finished. So he turns around and he looks at them and he watches his wife and his little girl walk into the backyard. And as he does so, he turns to them with this kind of a look of anxiety on his face. He accidentally kicks off a bucket of 100 screws off the top of the third floor of the play structure onto the ground in the dark. And my friend said, now there's several things I'd like to say to my husband <laughs> at this point, none of which would be helpful at all, none of which. But she said before she could say a thing, her little five-year-old girl let go of her hand and began running towards her dad. And she ran toward her dad who was on the third floor of the play structure and she stopped right at the bottom of the play structure. She said, oh, dad, I'm so sorry that happened. She's like, we're so grateful that you're building this for us. We can't wait to plan it. We're so happy. We cannot wait to plan this play structure. We're so glad you're doing this, dad. Mommy and I will help you pick up every screw right now. <laughs> So my friend said, okay, <laughs> here we go. And they, she got her iPhone out, and she got the flashlight out, and her husband climbed down three stories of the place structure, and she said, as I watched my little girl speak over the heart of her daddy, I saw his whole heart transform. And she's like, the three of us that night knelt in the grass and picked up 100 screws, and not one harsh word was spoken because the little girl spoke to her daddy. <laughs> You talk about the power of personal witness, the power of love. You know, and I think you and I in our life, you know, we've heard so many wonderful talks so far, and, and don't we know, like, don't we know the journey within, <laughs> the journey that must pass, like the journey of our lives and the journey of our story? So that's what we're going to talk about today is like the power of this witness 
that has the, there's a power through the power of the Holy Spirit to transform lives. Because like I said last night, the most powerful gospel you will ever preach, my dear friends, the most powerful gospel you will ever preach is how you live your day-to-day -day life. And yes, we use words in our gospel, and yes, we wor our words, but our words must resonate with how we live our life. Because all of us at times have moments of massive cognitive dissonance, where something is coming out of your mouth, and as it's coming out of your mouth, the Holy Spirit's like, don't say that, don't, do not say that, don't say that. And it's coming out of your mouth, and as you say, you're like, no. And it lands not with a transformation, it lands with a thud on somebody else's heart. And many times you're like, I can't believe I just said that. Or like, where did that come from? Have you ever said something and you're like, I have no idea why I just said that? Or it comes out with like a surprise or it comes out with an edge on it. And you're like, oh my gosh, I had no idea that I thought that. And your heart reveals something to you. And John Paul II, St. John Paul II spoke often of God. He met Spes that, you know, he says that Jesus makes man's supreme calling clear. He reveals us to ourselves. So we, you and I find out who we are. We, our lives only make sense in the light of Christ. That's it. So we're going to talk about your life today, and I'm going to share with you a bit of my story. Tomorrow in the keynote, tomorrow morning, I'll share with you a lot more details of my story. But I want to offer this to you because when we talk about the power of personal witness, our behavior, our behavior is always, always predicated on our beliefs. So how you're living your life, many times we focus on, you know, we, we've had parable of the weeds and the wheat, and Jesus says, you know, a tree is known by its fruit. So we see a whole bunch of fruit growing up here, and many times we're focused on the fruit. We're focused on other people's fruit also. <laughs> and we want to pick off their fruit off their tree, okay? So, but we have all this behavior and all this fruit, and we're focused on the fruit, and sometimes we have to. Like, we go to confession, and we take the fruit of our, the sin of our brokenness to confession. And we have to do that. But really, ultimately, what happens, and what we're going to talk about today, is not just the fruit, because the fruit is manifesting is because it has deep roots. There's a tree growing there, okay? So let me, I'm going to ask you in the course of this time a series of three questions, okay? So you can write these down if you want, but these are questions that the Lord asks us, and these are questions that um, the Lord asks you and I, and I often ask myself, and this, it's a great thing, and these are from the book of Genesis, okay? So, um, I'm, and I will unpack them for you as we continue on our way, okay? So the first question comes from Genesis chapter 16, verse 8 where we encounter a very sad situation of the slave girl named Hagar. And we heard about this in Daily Mass readings not too long ago. So as you know, Sarai and Abram want to have, a chil want to have children, and you see the dysfunction. I mean, we see the dysfunction throughout the Old Testament after the fall. We see the dysfunction. We see it in our own families. We see it in the, in the Bible. So we see what happens that they're promised a child, but they become impatient. So Sarai gives Abram, her husband, the maid servant, which he is quite happy to receive. Thank you very much. And so he is with her, and she is pregnant and be, you know, becomes pregnant, and then Hagar, the maid child, or the slave girl, ends up looking with scorn on Sarai. And Sarai's like, mm, this is my house. You will not look with scorn on me, okay? So she treats her horrendously, so badly, so badly that Hagar is in such sorrow that she runs away. And she runs out into the desert, and in the desert you die. There's nothing out there. Have you ever felt like you're in the desert of your life? <laughs> and you're looking around saying, where's the Lord? And what the Lord does to this slave girl is he sees her like he sees you and I, and he sends her a messenger, an angel. And the angel asks her this first question. He says, where have you come from? Where have you come from? And the second question he asks her is this, and where are you going? And the third question, so the angel asks her, where have you come from, and where are you going? And the third question that is asked is actually asked by God the Father himself that he asks Adam and Eve in the Genesis chapter 3, verse 9, when Adam and Eve are nowhere to be found, and he asks them this, where are you? So where have you come from, and where are you going, and where are you now? Because that is the witness of your life. That is the witness of your life. And so when we talk about where have you come from, I would imagine, especially if you come to this conference, you're probably attracted to this conference for a variety of reasons, the Defending the Faith Conference. Either you know a lot about your faith and you're always looking to learn more, or you don't and you want to learn more, or you want to be around people who are on this journey with you. There's reasons why we come. And so I'm sure if I were to ask, we're not going to do this, but if I were to ask you to give me a theological definition of where you came from, you probably could do that, okay? You could probably tell me that you came from God, that you're made in the image and likeness of God. 
um, one of my graduate school professors, he would repeat the first paragraph of the catechism over and over and over and over and over again until we started listening to what he was saying. You know, and I, when you read it in its fullness, it's absolutely beautiful, but he said this, and this is, they talk about where we come from and then where you come from. So the first paragraph of the catechism says this, God infinitely perfect and blessed in himself. This is so beautiful in a plan of sheer goodness. Freely creates man to share in his own blessed life. Right? God infinitely perfect and blessed in himself in a plan of sheer goodness. Freely creates man to share in his own blessed life. And then it says, for this reason, for this reason, in every time and in every place, God draws close to man. And he invites man to seek him, to know him, and to love him in return. Okay, so let's, let's unpack that for a second because this is a direct revelation of where you come from. God infinitely perfect and blessed in himself and a plan of sheer goodness. Which means, as you know, God's a family. The Trinity is a family. So we came, you and I came from a family. And God doesn't create out of need. Sometimes in our brokenness, we take people into our life out of a need to fill our own hearts. God doesn't do that. He does it out of sheer goodness. Just sheer goodness. He creates you out of his sheer goodness. Why? Why? So you could share in his own beautiful life, his own blessed life. We call it the beatific vision. So God has no, no other motive. This is so incredible. God has no other motive for creating you right now as you sit here today. Your life right now, as the Esther says, for a time such as this, he has no other motive, none, other than to bring you into his own beautiful life. He wants to bring you into the heart, his heart. He doesn't desire to manipulate you, to strong arm you, to guilt trip you. He's not trying to tell you something that you don't want to hear or sell you something you don't want to live. What God does is he actually creates us and then he woos us. You see that throughout the Old Testament over and over and over again when God makes covenants with his people and they keep breaking the covenant and he keeps being faithful and he compares Israel at times to an unfaithful wife and he's like, you're unfaithful to me but I'm not unfaithful to you. I love you. In the book of Hosea, he says, I will, I will bring her, I will allure her. I will bring her out into the desert. I'm going to hedge in her way so she can't get away from me. I'm going to allure her. I'm going to speak to the deepest desires of her hearts so she remembers that she's mine. And that's what he's doing in your life and my life. He's drawing close to you. Right now, right now, in every memory, in every moment, he's always drawing close. And I love the way that's set up because God is the divine initiator, right? God makes the gift. He's the initiator. And we're all, only the, our only response to him is just a response. That's it. It's a response to his love. So you're here today because of a response to his love. And he continues to speak to you. And he speaks through the church. He speaks through his word. He speaks through the sacraments. He speaks through our tradition. He speaks through many different things. But I know very well, and I know that you know it too, oh, he speaks a language just for you. <laughs> Have you ever had something happen to you and you know that it's God speaking to you? And people are like, how do you know? You're like, I just know. Like, I just know that's God speaking to me. It's like, it might sound weird to you, but I know it's God speaking to me. And don't families have languages like that? We have little nicknames for each other, or things that only make sense in a family. Lovers do that. People that love each other, they have funny little nicknames. You know, my mom to this day still calls me Munchkin Head. Nobody else in the world can call me Munchkin Head, but that's what my mom calls me, you know? Because <laughs> she loves me. I'm her Munchkin Head. I'll always be her little Munchkin Head, you know? That's the language of love. So he's always drawing close to us, which means he's always bringing us on a journey. And this is why when we talk about our story, I, I loved Father Sean's homily today. Can I just say that? He gave 1,300 people permission to sit in their story and to own their own story. I was like, amen, brother, you know? Because don't our stories feel like that at times? We've got this person, we've got this person. And just, it's very biblical. It's got that person and that person and that person, you know? So in our journey, like, what is your story? Because you come from God, and he's creating you to draw you into his own beautiful life, and you have a personal story as well. And you know, if you love a good story, whatever story that is for you, if you can think of maybe stories from your youth or stories even now, movies that you love or stories that you love, you know, stories have a predictable kind of path. You've got a protagonist, we've got an antagonist, you know, we've got some journey, we've got some obstacle. Usually the hero has some sort of fatal flaw or some issue or that they have to overcome. And it's sometime in the story, you know, you wonder at some point in the story, are they going to make it? <laughs> and have you ever wondered in your life if you're going to make it? And you're like, man, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to make it through this one. 
And why stories resonate so deeply with us is because we're part of a good story. We're part of the best story ever. It's called Salvation History. And every single person, this is why Pope Benedict in his inaugural homily as Holy Father, he said, we are not some meaningless product of evolution. Every person, every person is willed, is loved, and is necessary, right? We are not some meaningless product of evolution, some casual kind of, you know, component of just some sort of, you know, random union of cells. Each person is willed, each person is loved, and each person is necessary. So in your life, this journey that you're on, like where have you come from, means that we have chapters, like every good story has many chapters to it. So if you were to think right now, no matter how old you are, no matter how old you are, if you kind of stop right here and you kind of think of where you are, your story, I bet, has a lot of chapters to it. And some of the chapters are really beautiful. <laughs> and some of the chapters are really joyful. And some of the chapters are really painful. And it's many times that those painful chapters of our story, my dear friends, that we first of all don't want to admit to and we push them aside and we say things like, well, I got over that. That doesn't affect me now. Okay. There's a wonderful saying that I often say. If you've ever heard me speak, I've probably said this because I say it all the time. There's a wonderful saying in healing circles that says this, suffering that is not transformed is transmitted. Right? Suffering that is not transformed is transmitted. And this is a very sobering statement because what this means is every, any suffering that you've had in your life that has not been transformed by the Lord, transformed by his grace, and that happens in many different ways, that suffering doesn't just go away. Because what we do as children, we learn, we're very smart as children. If you ever try to like, study child psychology, how, how we cope with, how we have coping mechanisms, how we kind of survive life. And many times the things that happen to us, the foundational, like the, the beginning parts of our story, like Genesis, those foundational wounds many times affect us our entire life. And we grow up and we call it adulting. <laughs> and we say that we get over it. But many times we grow up and we have addictions. Like I said myself, I'm a recovering alcoholic. I had an addiction for many, many years, many years, many years. And for many years I was trying to be, deal with the behavior. I was trying to like, modify that behavior and it just wasn't working for me. It's because I had a massive, massive deep root. The other root was sexual abuse. And that was a story that was never told. And I thought... That when I got older and I got, you know, I, I grew up and I graduated, I played Division I volleyball. I wanted to work for ESPN. I joked that Aaron Andrews stole my job, so I became a nun instead. And, um, <laughs> kidding, uh, kind of, <laughs> you know. I thought that the day that I made my vows to the Lord, so I've been professed almost 17 years now, okay? So the day that I made my vows to the Lord, I thought all my problems would go away because that's what happens in the sound of music, okay? So, um, <laughs> shockingly enough, that didn't happen, you know? And I'm just, this is honest, I mean, I tell my story a lot, it's like the very honest part of my story. I was in religious life, I've been in like 20 years now, so I've been in, I was in religious life for quite some time, probably, what is it, eight, plus 12, eight, about eight years. I'd made my first vows, I was at this mission, and I was like, something's not right. <laughs> like, something's wrong. If you've ever come to stages in your life where you're just like, something's not right, like your joy has been stolen, like you're just not joyful, like you're going through the motions, you're showing up to life every day, okay? But something was missing, and it was at that moment that I realized that there were parts of my story, there were chapters of my story that, first of all, I had never even, I never even wanted to own or look at. There were chapters of my story that had never been read, so to speak. And all I wanted them to do was go away. And it wasn't until, through the grace of a lot of, a lot of suffering, just a lot of people and a lot of grace in my life, where it was only through those stories it was only through having them read, not by myself alone, but by the Lord and by people who love me very much. It was only through the transformation of those stories that resurrection began to pour forth in my life. And it is still happening even as I stand here before you today. And I hope it never ends. I hope it never ends. So in your journey, do you have stories in your life that you don't want to own? <laughs> Here's another saying that you will hear in 12-step meetings if you've ever been to a 12-step meeting. The saying is this, we're only as sick as our secrets. Right? We're only as sick as our secrets. And many times we're sick, we're very sick because we have secrets and marriages have secrets and families have secrets, churches have secrets, right? And isn't that what's happening right now? The secrets of the church are coming out and aren't they horrific? But they must come out. They have to come out because the bride is sick. She is sick. 
because she has a lot of secrets. So the secrets must come out. Why? So the light of Christ can transform her so that his love, so his blood can wash her and purify her so that she can be made whole. And that is the same way with you and I. So where have you come from in your life? What are the joyful mysteries? What are are the moments that one story that I often tell about my mom is, you know, my mother and I, my mother, she and I did not get along for a long time. And so we had just, we hit heads a lot. So I often tell mothers, mothers or grandmothers, if you have, you know, troubled granddaughters or daughters, there's hope. Don't worry. Okay, that's not the end of the story. Okay, so there is hope. Um, But my mom and I, one of the reasons why we had such a powerful uh, transformation in our relationship was through one of the deepest sufferings in our life. And my dad, my sweet father, my parents were married, gosh, like 36 years. Um, My dad retired early so he could go and do volunteer work for my religious community. Okay, so they ret- my dad retired early. My parents would travel down to our missions, and my dad was an electrician, and you know, he and my mom built things, and they could fix stuff. You know, if you give my dad like a gun wrapper and a paper clip, he could fix a house with it. You know, it was one of those guys. And so um, I was in Rome. I was very young. I was in Rome fin- just starting my studies as a religious sister. And um, one night, uh, I was there at the house in Rome, and the phone rang in the middle of the night. And you know how just sometimes it just, I don't know what that is. It's like when phones ring in the middle of the night, it's like never good news. And I was upstairs, and I heard the phone ring, and I can't explain it to you, but I just had this sick feeling in the pit of my stomach. But then a few minutes passed, and it went away. Uh, So I was like, maybe that's not for me. But then uh, there was a knock on my door, and it was my religious superior. And she opened my door, and I could see her face because her face was illumined by the streetlight, and she had tears in her eyes. And she said, Sister Miriam, your mom and dad are on the phone. I said, okay. So I went downstairs, and I had no idea what was about to happen to me. I had no idea. And I picked up the phone, and it was my mom. And she said, "Um, honey, uh, I have to tell you something. And I said, what is it? She's like, your dad, your dad just has been sick lately. They were at a mission. They were literally at a mission doing construction work at one of our missions. So they went to this doctor they didn't even know. She's like, your dad has been sick lately, and uh, we took him to the doctor today. And I said, what happened? And she said, your dad was um, diagnosed with cancer today. And I said, well, what kind of cancer? How bad is it? And she said, your dad was diagnosed with terminal cancer today. He has pancreatic cancer. And that was Fat Tuesday. That was the day before Ash Wednesday. And we buried him on Ascension Thursday. So I came home, and I was 24 years old, and I came home, and it was just my, I have an older brother, but he, you know, he kind of lives his own life, and so I went home, and um, my mom and I took care of my dad, and it was something about taking care, if you've ever taken care of somebody who's very ill, you know that it makes life very clear very quickly, and there was something about that where our family secrets began to come out, and our lives slowly began to transform, because there were some things that my dad needed to know before he passed away, and so all of our secrets came out. And it was in that time where my dad also made amends to me and he made amends to the family before he passed away. And my mother and I were there like the day that he was diagnosed. My mom called me on the phone. The day that my dad went to eternity to see God face to face, my mom and I were there again today, that day. And we stood on each side of his hospital bed as he was laboring to breathe and we prayed the rosary. And as we finished the Hail Holy Queen, he took three more breaths and he passed away. And it was, I tell you, one of the most beautiful and most sorrowful moments of my entire life. And it transformed my mom and I's relationship. And so my mom now, I'll I'll tell tell you more about my mom tomorrow, but I love my mama so much, you know. And so I go and visit my mom um, for a couple weeks every year. And so she lives out on the Oregon coast. And so we usually go to the beach for a couple days. And I I tell this story often that several years ago we were at the beach. And, you know, in the Oregon, I'm not sure, like, when you guys go to the lake here, but in Oregon it's always 55 degrees and raining because it's Oregon. Like, that's what happens there. So uh, sure enough, it is 55 degrees and raining. It's August in Oregon. And so we wanted to go for a walk on the beach, but we couldn't go for a walk on the beach because it was raining. So we went to Daily Mass and we went upstairs. And um, as soon as we got upstairs, I opened this huge sliding glass window. It was this huge picture window. And as soon as I opened it, you could just hear the waves crashing onto the shore of the beach. And you know when rain first moves in, you can smell the rain, you know. So we're sitting there in front of the window watching the waves and listening to the waves and smelling the rain. And we each each had these huge cups of coffee, which every Catholic knows is the eighth sacrament. So we're sitting there with them. (laughs) All right. So we're sitting there, and uh, we had this um, moment. And I had this moment, and I know you've had it too, 
And even as I say this, I tell this story all the time, but even as I say this, I remember it as if it happened just today. I had this moment, and I know you've had it too, where you say to yourself, I wish time would stop right here. And I wish this beauty, I wish this intimacy, I wish this joy, I wish this moment would never end. I wish it would never end. And it's not a theological term, but I call it, those are the appetizers to the main entree (laughs) of heaven when it will never end. And do we not have those? And I don't know what that is for you. If you think of a moment right now, I can tell because some of you are smiling. (laughs) If you think of a moment right now where you say to yourself, "I I wish it would have never ended. Those are our stories. That's Christ hearkening to us. It's him drawing close to us. That no matter what has happened, like where you've come from, my dear friends, it doesn't disqualify you from any, any area of sanctity, any area of holiness, any area of hope. Because sanctity is not just found in beautiful stained glass windows in your lovely churches. Sanctity is found here in this room right now. It's not despite of your story. Oh, well, God saves you because even though you have this story, God saves you. God saves you in your story. <laughs> Because he sanctifies all things. He's present at all times. And there's not one part of your story that's outside of his mercy, outside of his healing power, outside of his ability to weave and to make beautiful. St. Augustine said, God would not allow anything to happen to us that he does not plan to bring a greater good out of. And I don't know, like, why does God allow things to happen when you look at yourself, like you look at that question of where have I come from, you know, and you might be sitting here today saying, sister, I just, I've got like books that haven't been read. Forget about chapters. I've got like whole books of books that have not been read in my story, okay? Okay. That's fine. And Christ is waiting there for you whenever you want to read it. He's waiting there for you. Because there's nothing, you know, I, I heard somebody say in a documentary one time, he was talking about his own journey. And he was talking about how his life had just been obliterated by his addiction. And it just was a heart-wrenching story. But he said, you know what? He said, what I realized after I got finally honest with my life, he said, even though it was really, really hard and it nearly destroyed my marriage, they ended up rebuilding their marriage. It's an amazing story. But he said, I realized at that moment that after all of it was uncovered, the whole truth came out. He said he realized that in his soul, it looked like a barren, like a desert, like a barren wasteland, but inside was a seed. <laughs> and he said, I realized right then and there that if there's a seed, that there can be life because there's nothing so dead that God can't bring something to life out of it. Nothing. Whether that's your marriage, whether that's your grandkids, whether that's something that happened to you. Maybe you've been estranged from your children for many years and you're saying to yourself, my kids won't even talk to me. There's nothing so dead that God can't bring life out of it. Right? So my dear friends, we must, we must engage our story. So like, where have you come from in your life? Because the whole story has to be read, right? So then we look at where we're going. So we talk about where we're coming from. It's kind of like a trajectory this way. And we're always on a journey because stories are always on a journey. So you and I are always on a journey. So where are you going in life? Where are you headed? What is the trajectory of your life? Where are you stuck? (laughs) Where is God giving you wondrous grace right now? Where is he bringing life into you right now? Where are, you, where are you headed? Do we know where we're headed? I, you, know, I, I live in, you know, I live in the great nation of Texas, so I live in the southern part of Texas, okay? So when we secede, you can join us. Okay, so here we go. And I'm um, totally joking. Uh, I live in South Texas, so I live in Corpus Christi, which I, Highway 37, which goes up through San Antonio and up all the way through Texas, dead ends and begins in Corpus Christi, okay? So you have to really want to go to Corpus Christi. You can't really like, drive by Corpus Christi. It just doesn't happen, okay? So which means to get to Corpus Christi, you have to know how to get to Corpus Christi or like any, any place else. If you want to go to Pittsburgh, you want to go to Chicago, you have to know how to get there. So if you don't know where your destination is, how are you going to get there? Like, where am I going? Somebody once said, you know, if I don't know, if you don't know where you came from, it's so great. If you don't know where you came from and you don't know where you're going, you're going to be easily manipulated, right? If you don't know where you came from and you don't know where you're going, you're going to be easily manipulated. So we know we came from God and we're on this journey and we have this story, right? And God is the storyteller. He's the one, he's the hero of the story and he's bringing redemption to our story and he's bringing meaning to our story and he's bringing illumination to our story and he's also bringing us on a journey, which means that it's, a journey goes forward one step at a time. And sometimes we fall down <laughs> and sometimes we lay there for a while and just like a beached whale, we just lay there for a while and we're not really sure if we want to get up. We, we do, but we're not really sure, you know. I love in, in the Gospel of John when Jesus approaches the paralytic man, you know, who's paralyzed and he asks him a question like, do you want to be well? <laughs> He's like, bro, man, been here 38 years, yo. Like, seriously, I, 38 years? Yeah, I, yeah, you know? 
It's interesting. Do you want to be well? And that's many of the questions that Jesus would ask me during the story of my life because I wasn't, you know, I wasn't, sh- there were parts of my heart where I wasn't really sure if I wanted to be well. And even as an adult, as I'm maturing now, it's good that we mature because we mature on five different levels, okay? As human beings, when St. Paul talks about us maturing, he says we're called to grow into the maturity of Christ. So ultimately, our maturity is not compared to you and myself. And I can look at you. If you look at somebody you admire very deeply, You'll, you will probably admire their areas of maturity, like they're, they're sacrificial, they're noble, they're, they have integrity, they're wise, they're good, they put others before themselves, but they're also very careful to, you know, to, to safeguard the, their own sanctity within. So you look at somebody like that, but we mature what? We mature physically, emotionally, spiritually, physically, sexually. So we're called to be on a journey of maturity, which means growth. And you think about growth as like a tree. So you talk about a tree bearing fruit, and you've got a trunk of a tree, and then you've got roots of the tree. And to have a really mature tree, the tree has to have what? Deep roots. And it has to be healthy. Did you know this? This is fascinating. Did you know, like, I didn't realize this, but forests, like forest trees have, like, their own language. It's not just in Lord of the Rings. They actually have their own language, okay? So when forests come together, when trees come together in a forest, their roots actually intertwine. Check, this is amazing. Their roots intertwine underneath the soil, and the roots go very, very, very deep. Did you know that in the forest, there are what, what scientists call mother trees, And mother trees can sense when weaker trees need extra nutrients. They will send the excess nutrients of their own tree to the roots of the tree that's sick, so to make it strong. That's trees, y'all. You know what I'm saying? Like, what? Trees. (laughs) Whoa. You're talking about maturity. Maturity in our life. And one of the biggest areas when we talk about, you know, it's very similar into, you know, when Jesus encounters the disciples on the road to Emmaus. what, What I'm asking you now, like from Genesis is very similar to what Jesus asked the disciples in the Gospel of Luke. Because, you know, the, the, the angel says to Hagar, where have you come from and where are you going? And Jesus, what happens in the same journey, he comes along to the disciples and he asks them a question. He says, what are you guys discussing? What are you discussing as you walk along the way? So great. Because what happens, they're in a hot debate over, they're in a hot debate over what just happened in Jerusalem. And they're so, they're so closed in on themselves and they're debating so vehemently over what just happened in Jerusalem that Jesus literally appears in their midst and he walks with them and they don't recognize him. Have you ever been so turned in on yourself <laughs> and so consumed by something, whether, even if it's in your own self-righteousness? I mean, have you ever been in an argument with somebody and it ceases to be about the thing and you just have to be right? What? You know? We just become so consumed and we lose all track of like what is good, true, and beautiful. And we become so consumed that Christ comes into our midst and we don't even see him. We don't even recognize him. So on your journey, my dear friends, where is Christ leading you on your journey? Because he's leading you ultimately toward himself. But where in the journey is he wishing to bring you life? One of the biggest areas of, of, of places where you and I are stuck many times are areas of unforgiveness in our life. We talk about the Our Father. We're going to talk about that. We're going to hear that, actually, in the gospel. We're going to hear about the gospel where, where you know, the, the disciples go to Jesus, and they say to him, you know, uh, Lord, teach us how to pray. Like John taught his disciples, like, teach us how to pray. And so Jesus teaches the disciples how to pray. And at the heart of that prayer is what? Forgive us our trespasses. Yeah. That's a very serious thing to say. <laughs> Did you know that one of the, I, I do a lot of work in healing ministry and in my own journey, my tw- I've been on a really a very, very serious journey of healing for 12 years. So I know this myself. I know it in stories. I know it from reading. I know it just being around people. One of the biggest areas of brokenness, one of the biggest areas of staying stuck in resentment and bitterness and hard-heartedness and blaming other people for our problems, one of the biggest areas that we struggle with is areas of unforgiveness. Here's another great saying in a 12-step meeting. Resentment is like drinking a little bit of poison every day and hoping the other person dies. Resentment is like drinking a little bit of poison every day and hoping the other person dies. Because I tell you this, the person that abused me was the, one of the deepest wounds, one of them, not even, the, not even the most, one of the deepest wounds in my entire life. And I remember, I remember saying as a young girl, I will never, I will never forgive you. I will never forgive you, which is a very dangerous, that's a very dangerous vow to make. Ooh, if, you've, if you've ever made that vow, you can actually, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of it, and I would highly recommend you do. Because what that does, when we are areas of unforgiveness, what we're trying to do is we're trying to protect ourselves. 
So we build these elaborate fortresses around our hearts. We talk about where we're going. We build these elaborate fortresses around our hearts, and it it, it gives us the illusion of self-protection. And it's the hard-heartedness of self-righteousness, of self-reliance, of blaming other people, of of just, you know, even sometimes a victim mentality where, you know, it's like we're always the victim. I know because I did it all. (laughs) And underneath it was a little girl who was so broken and so angry, and I had no idea what to do with it. And that anger doesn't go away. For me, it turned inward, and it became clinical depression. And there I am just trying to get through life, you know, and here I am, a religious sister, and I'm still struggling. I'm having all these issues and all these problems, you know. And I realized, I realized at one point, by the grace of God, that after so many years of living like that, after so many years as a young girl struggling with alcoholism and as a young girl struggling with promiscuity and a lot of brokenness, clinical depression, a lot of anger, just a lot of bitterness, and a lot of perfectionism, So I had two competing narratives happening. One, you know, on the outside, I thought if I was just skinny enough and pretty enough and funny enough and good enough at volleyball and good enough at school, you wouldn't notice. Because on the inside, I hated myself. And I thought to myself, if you ever knew my story, what I can so freely share with you now in such joy, if you'd ever known my story, there's no way you'd want to be around somebody like me. And these elaborate self-defense mechanisms and after 20 years of living in resentment, or a lot more than that, like all these years of living in resentment and bitterness and kind of, you know, blaming other people, all this kind of stuff, all these self-defense mechanisms, after all those years of doing that, who was the person that was still sick? Me. And I had a moment, I had a, a moment in my conversion story where I was pondering the, the parable of the unforgiving servant, right, where Jesus tells that story where Peter comes to Jesus and he's like, you know, how often do we have to forgive? Like seven times? Like 70 times? Seven times? She's like, oh, Peter, let me tell you a story. <laughs> you know? So you know the story very well, and I won't. At my parish missions, I usually go into the story much more deeply. But, you know, he tells a story of the unforgiving steward who, or unforgiving servant who uh, owes the master a lifetime of wages. And the master knows that the servant owes him a lifetime of wages, and it can never pay it back. And I love the words, because listen to the heart of Christ, my dear friends. Even in the master, even in this parable, just a story, Jesus puts his own heart in the heart of the master, the forgiving master, where he says, moved with pity moved with kindness, moved with compassion and mercy. He forgives the man his entire debt. And what happens? That servant gets up and he goes out into the, uh, the, you know, the household because, you know, slaves had households and they had organizations of, like, hierarchies of slaves. And he grabs a fellow slave and, he, and it just the visual imagery is beautiful. He begins to choke him. It's like seize him and throttle him, saying, pay back what you owe. Pay back what you owe me. And that man owed him six months' wages. Like, the, the, the comparison is not even applicable. To, it's not even c- close to being equal. And what happens? That servant falls on his knees, and he says verbatim, verbatim, verbatim. The other servant had just said to the master, but the unforgiving servant is having none of it. And he orders him to be sold, his family to be sold, and the debt to be paid. And the other servants in the household are horrified. And they go back to the master and they repeat to the master what everything had happened. And the master calls in that servant, and I'm paraphrasing here. He calls him in and he says, what are you doing? What are you doing? You asked me, you begged me to forgive you your entire debt, and I did it because you asked me to. But this man, this fellow servant of yours who owes you a mere fraction of the amount, him you cannot forgive. And that servant says nothing, nothing. He doesn't say, oh my gosh, you're right. Like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that. Or, yes, you're, you're right, so I'm so sorry. He says nothing. Very interesting. And in that moment, pondering that story, I was well into religious life. This is many years ago. I was well into religious life many years ago. And I had a vision of myself in that parable, and I can tell you now that I wasn't the benevolent master I was the unforgiving servant, and I had that man that had abused me by the collar of his shirt, so to speak, and I had my finger in his face saying, man, you pay back what you owe me, because you owe me, you owe me. And what I realized right there, I was horrified, horrified. And I remember in my vision, I just... I backed away. I was just so just, I had no idea. Like, you talk about things you had no idea that were in your heart. That was the Holy Spirit. And in my heart, I just released my grasp on that man. I was like, I can't, I can't do this. Like, I can't do this. And I didn't want to go back to my addiction. That ship had sailed. Like, I didn't want Like, I wanted to be well because I was laboring under a, under a, fundal, a fundamental misunderstanding of forgiveness. Because I thought to forgive, like, we have that silly saying in English that says, forgive and forget. <laughs> There's no such thing. 
Actually, you know what? It's in the catechism when it talks about this. It says the human intellect it doesn't even have the capacity to forget, so to speak. But, but it says this, but with transformation, with transformation, with the grace of the Holy Spirit, that pain can be turned into intercession for the one who has hurt us. And I thought, you know what, if I forgive you, if I forgive you, I'm just letting you off the hook. And you can't be let off the hook. Because I can tell you right now to this day, that man is not sorry. And I've confronted him twice. And he's not sorry at all. And those are points in our story where I have to decide, where am I going? And do I want to be well? So let me ask you this. Are you still asking people to pay you back for something they can't pay you back for? My dear friends, what was taken from you, they can't pay it back. They can't. But... When we are willing to take a full account of the wounds, forgiveness is not just words, it's not just like pretending, it's not just saying it. Actually to forgive is a really crucifying experience because you actually have to unveil all of the wound. And all the emotions have to come out. The whole story has to be told and it goes down into the depths and we know it goes down into the depths is because Christ goes down into the depths. (laughs) Because what is he saying on the cross? Stripped naked, he's the bridegroom stripped naked for the bride. And people are still harassing him. They're still spitting on him. They're still abusing him. And he hangs there and he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So do you have in your journey, like, do you have areas of life that have areas of unforgiveness? And you know what? Forgiveness is different than reconciliation. But do you on your end? And I tell you, this is a sister in Christ, somebody on the journey with you. Do you have areas in your story? Are there people in your life that you can't even stand to look at? Or that you're still gossiping about? Or that when every Thanksgiving, like this, certain things happen, you know, like, I don't know, it was something Aunt Sally said 20 years ago at Thanksgiving, and our kids are not playing with her kids anymore. Thank you very much. Okay, so, whoa, you know. But Christ wants to bring you to freedom. And today's, maybe today's the day, right? Are there things that are impeding you on your journey? Because when Jesus says in the Gospel of Luke, or the Gospel of John, chapter 10, 10, he said, it's a thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came that you might have life and have it to the full. So what in your life, what is preventing the fullness of life for you right now? Is there something in your life? Is it a relationship? Is it a secret? Is it an area of your life where we are laboring under a misunderstanding of who God is? Because I love this. In Catechism 239, Catechism 239 says this. It says, by calling God Father, right, the language of faith indicates two main things, that God is the first origin of everything and transcendent authority, and that he is at the same time goodness and loving care for all of his children. This is so great. God's parental tenderness can also be expressed by the image of motherhood, which emphasizes God's imminence, his his indwelling, the intimacy between creator and creature, But so this experience, this language of faith um, draws on the human experience of parents who are in a way the first representatives of God for man. But this experience also tells us that human parents are fallible and can disfigure the face of fatherhood and motherhood. We ought therefore to recall that God transcends the human distinction between the sexes. He is neither man nor woman, he is God. He also transcends human fatherhood and motherhood. Although he is their origin and standard, no one is father as God is father. So as father, he's an origin in your life. And are you and I have areas of our life that we're, we're laboring under a misunderstanding of God? I know for myself for a long time, and you know, in our journey, like, you know, we grew up, as, we grew up Catholic in our family, and, but our, fa- our religion was largely fear-based, okay? So don't do this, otherwise you're gonna go to hell. Don't do that, you're gonna go to hell. I mean, there, is there such thing as mortal sin? Yes, okay? But there was no emphasis on God loves us, so here's why we do what we do. There's an emphasis on what we're doing, but here's why we do it. There was not that. And I mean, you know, many times I had this image of God kind of like as a policeman in the sky, you know, with a ticket book watching me. He's left-handed, by the way. Ticket book watching me, and he is taking note of all of my failures and all of my sins and all of my brokenness. And, you know, as I heard somebody once say, I just always had the feeling that God was mildly disgusted with me. Right? Are there parts of our hearts where and it could, be, it could come from our stories. This is why, my dear friends, this is why our stories must be made known. Is, are we laboring under a misunderstanding of who God is? 
Because see, what we learn in the scriptures, why we, why we must know the scriptures, why we must absorb them, not just know them here, we must form our intellects, but why they must come from here to here is that they form our hearts is because it is God constantly telling a story of who he is. Who he is. It's God, the gospels are the stories of who Christ is, who God is. That he's coming into your life and my life and he's saying to you, I don't want to dominate you. <laughs> I don't want to manipulate you. Like he comes as a baby, he comes as an innocent child, he comes naked and vulnerable. I was, I was on an eight-day silent retreat last year, and this Jesuit priest was leading me through this meditation on the nativity, and he said, Jesus, he said, Jesus comes to earth, he comes to us naked and vulnerable because he's showing us how to be human. This openness, where we're often heart of heart, he's not heart of heart. And he comes and he reveals himself, and he's always healing the sick, and he's raising the dead, and he's touching people, he's just getting right into their lives to remind them of who they are and who he is to them. And then he agrees, he submits to be crucified on a cross the way that shame, it's a shameful death. Only slaves and rebels were crucified. So Roman citizens were not crucified. St. Paul was beheaded. Slaves and rebels were crucified. And Christ agrees. And he's a man like us in all things but sin. He's taken on every sin of ours. He's taken on every suffering and he is always present because see, the beautiful thing is Christ comes into our life and he came into earth 2,000 years ago. But because God transcends time, God is transcendent. God actually lives outside of time. We call it kairos, right? The eternal now. So if you can imagine this, when we talk about where we've come from and where we're going, and I'm going to ask you my last question here, okay? So the power of your witness of where have you come from and where are you going and where are you now? You and I live in chronological time. So right now it is like 440, okay? And an hour from now it'll be 540, Tomorrow afternoon, it'll be 4.40. It'll be 24 hours from now. And you can turn around and you can look back on your day and you can say this happened and this happened and this happened, okay? So you, all of us who are here now were once five years old. We were once 10. We were once 20. Some of us were once 60. That's okay, 70, 80. That's fine. All right, here we go. So we're on the spectrum of chronological time, right? So things for, we call it chronos. So things unfold for us in chronological time. But see, God doesn't live in chronological time. God lives in kairos, what we call the eternal now. So here's this, imagine this for just a second, that we are present to God now, right now as we are, is in this chapel, we're present to God now. You were also present to God and he is present to you when you were five. You were also present to him and he's present to you the day that you leave chronological time and you too enter into Kairos. Every single moment of your life is present to God now which means that every single moment of your life is full of his resplendence, which means there is nothing in your life that has ever happened that is outside of his healing power. Nothing. Nothing is so dead, God can't bring life out of it. What oftentimes mitigates against a witness of Christ, like what Monsignor Pope was talking about last night, one of the things that mitigates it is when our words say something and our lives reveal something different. There's a dichotomy between the two. And you, we know we can always talk about that. You know, we can talk about the right words, but like the wrong tone of voice. Like, you know, it's very, even when you're listening, many times you're listening to me, you're listening on so many different levels right now, what your brain is doing as you're listening. So when I first stood up before you, you were, first of all, you were assessing whether I was trustworthy or not. Did you know that? Yeah? So I read a study many years ago that, and it is, it's actually condensed now, but many years ago I read a study that said that 80% of people's opinion of you, 80% of people's opinion of you is made up within the first four minutes that they meet you. 80% of their opinion is made up in the first four minutes. Now scientists say it's within the first four seconds. So immediately, when you meet me and I meet you, your, your brain is firing certain things. Our eyes are looking at each other. Mirror neurons are being you know, produced. All kinds of things are happening. You're looking at me. You're, you're also like trying to intuit if I'm trustworthy or not. Because to trust somebody, when we talk about trusting the Lord, to trust somebody, the definition of trust is to rely upon somebody, to be dependent upon somebody. And so this is why if you and I don't have a proper understanding of who God is, why would we trust him? If God is like when a French bishop once said, you know, when he talked about original sin, the Satan says to us that God is an avaricious, self-serving master. <laughs> That's what Satan's lie is to us. He's already spoken it to you a million times today. That he's not a good father and he doesn't love you. Oh, really? He's so good? Oh, why did that happen to you then? Oh, you prayed that. You prayed that your husband wouldn't pass away. He passed away. You prayed that your kid would get that job. He didn't get that job. Oh, really, why did God allow that to happen to you? It's the same lie over and over and over and over and over again. So God is constantly revealing of who he is. 
And he's coming into our lives and he's speaking the truth to us. Because it's his desire, what, to draw near to us. And when you love somebody, you draw near to them. And it is your only desire that they would draw near to you as well. And do we not have people in our lives? I know that I do. There are people in my life that I would love to be close to, that I try to be. I mean, like I said, I'm very serious on my healing journey of trying to become the woman that God has created me to be and open and receptive and honest and, and forthright and, and, you know, full of integrity and things like that. And I try to be a really good friend of my friends. And, you know, sometimes people will come into your life and they will open and, like, our hearts draw close together. But do you have people in your life that you just wish that you knew them or you just wish that they would share with you and they just won't? And you're like, and you can't violate that. You cannot manipulate it. All you can do is draw close and just have an open heart and just wait. And I say to myself, man, I like you a lot. Like, you're so awesome. I, I so want to know you. Like, I would love to be a closer friend to you. Like, I would love to know you. Like, can you just, you know, ugh. And they're like, no. And you're like, all right. <laughs> mm, I miss you. <laughs> you know. And it is the same thing with us, that God draws close to us. He draws close to us. With no other desire, my dear friend, than to bring you into his own beautiful life. He desires to forgive you, to heal you, to speak to the deep places. He desires to heal your relationships, to melt our hardness of heart, to heal us of addictions, to heal us of our self-righteousness, to heal us of all the ways that make us less human. Because Jesus Christ is a man fully alive. And when we allow him to do that, people ask me all the time. They ask me all the time, Sister Miriam, what is the one thing I can do to make my marriage better? What is the one thing I can do to be a better coworker? What is the one thing I can do to be a better parent? What's the one thing I can do to be a better grandparent? Like, what's the one thing I can do? And I say this to them, and I'm saying it to myself as I'm saying it to you, and I'm not being platitudinous at any mean, by any means. And I will always say the best gift, the best gift you can give to your spouse, to your children, to your grandchildren, to your coworkers, the best gift you can give them is to allow Jesus Christ to come and heal you every day to have a daily encounter with the living Lord Jesus, that is the best gift you can give to anybody else. Because as we allow him to transform us, then we're not transmitting our suffering onto them. And yes, in our brokenness, we will say we're sorry, and we will have to say, we will say I love you, we will say thank you, we will say please, we will do all these things. But what happens is that I'm not, I'm not transmitting on my suffering to them. What happens is I'm passing on to them a transforming grace. And all of us become a little bit more human huh, through that process. So my last question to you is from Genesis uh, chapter 3, uh, verse 9, where it is the breezy time of the day, and I love that imagery as well, where God walks with Adam and Eve in the breezy time of the day. And it's the breezy time of the day, and they're nowhere to be found. And he goes in search of them, and I think we have to be very, very careful about assigning a tone of voice to God, okay? Okay. So like we talked about, even as you're listening to me, you're listening to my words, but you're also listening to my affect. You're, you're watching my body language. There's a whole bunch of things happening here when you're listening to me. And so it's the same when God speaks to us. There's a whole bunch of things happening. And as he comes to Adam and Eve, he knows what has happened. And he's drawing close to them like he's drawing close to you and me. And he comes to them and he asks them this. Where are you? Where are you? And that's a great question, because sometimes I ask God where he is, but he doesn't need to be asked where he is. I like, I need to know where I am. <laughs> and he comes to me, he's like, my bride, where are you? I'm like, dude, I have no idea where I am right now. Could you come? I think I'm off in the weeds somewhere. Like, I have no idea where I, could you come find me? Because I need to be found. And he comes to us and he says, where are you? Because our temptation, like Al Cresta was talking about today when he was talking about this very story, I love how the Holy Spirit weaves talks together. This very story, our first temptation, my dear friends, is to hide so if, I, you're, if I'm talking to you today and you're hearing things and you just want to hide, it's okay. Like, that's very normal. <laughs> We're like, oh, I don't want to look at that. Okay, okay. But the Lord comes to them and he says, where are you? Where are you? And you see that so often with little children. I ran a daycare for many years at a Catholic school in Seattle. And you see that with many with children. You know, I spent many hours of my life. I was there for eight years. And I was studying for a master's degree in theology at that time and things like that. I've spent many hours of my life, many hours of my life, people putting Barbie heads back on Barbies, okay? That, I'm a, I, have a, I have a master's degree in putting Barbie heads back on. Can I just say that? So I would go, and every day after, bar, I'm like, what happened? why are people ripping heads off Barbies? I have no idea. So I would spend, I'm putting heads back on the Barbies, okay? Putting all the heads back on, put some clothes on. I don't know what's happening there, okay? So put all the girls back together, looking good, girls, okay, heads on, all right? So I would go over to the registration table and start signing kids in, 
by 3.30, I see like a bunch of girls, like a bunch of girls gathered like in a big circle, you know, something happens, and all of a sudden they scatter and there's heads all over the floor. <laughs> and they're nowhere to be found, there's just a bunch of heads. And I would find one of the girls and be like, hey, what's, what's happening here? Oh, I don't know, sister. I'm like, that's really interesting because I just spent 20 minutes putting all their heads back on. So I know that they were head, they had heads 20 minutes ago. Like, I know that because I did it, you know? So can you tell me what happened? I have no idea how that happened. I'm like, I just find that hard to believe. Like, I'm just not believing you right now. Like, you're totally making that up and you're hiding. So get over here and put their heads back on. Okay, so, you know, but that is our first temptation is to hide. That is our first temptation to hide. And please notice that God the Father doesn't go to them and he doesn't go to you and me. He's not like, where are you? Oh, he's so good to us. He comes to us, he's like, where are you? Where are you? And in your life today, my dear friends, wherever you find yourself, whatever is happening in your mind right now, let me just ask you this, because the Father is asking of you, where are you? Because I want to meet you where you are. Wherever that is in your story, I want to meet you there. And I'm not afraid. He's like, I'm not afraid. I'm already there, and I want to meet you there. So would you let me? Would you let me meet you there? Because that's what he delights to do. And when we allow him in these stories, when we allow him in these memories, he's already there, but when we allow him to transform it, what happens, my dear friends, is our lives take on a vibrance. Our lives take on a vibrance. Like I said to you, I'm a nun today. One of the reasons I'm a nun today is because of the witness of a very holy priest. And I had never met anybody in my life that was so sold out for Jesus Christ as that man. And he had a story himself. He wasn't perfect. Nobody's perfect. But man, he loved Jesus Christ. And he was funny and down to earth, and he would tell me the truth whether I wanted to hear it or not. He told me the truth in season and out season. He saw me as I was. He came to the garden, so to speak, saying, where are you? Like, don't you want more than that? What are you doing with your life? Don't you want more than what you're settling for? You are totally settling. God loves you, and he's calling you to something great. What are you doing with your life? And I had a distinct, I, many times when he would look at me, I would see Jesus Christ himself looking back at me. And there I was, 21 years old, a girl, like he had been a priest a long time, and he knew what was up, but he pursued me. And I remember standing one day looking at him saying, it was like giving up, like there's a lot of things in my life that I doubted. I didn't trust anybody. I didn't trust anything. And there was a lot of things in life that I was like, I don't know if I want to have anything to do with this, but I could not deny the power of his witness. Because for better and for worse, and for all the chapters of his story, all the transformation, man, he lived an integrated life. And when he lived an integrated life, Christ's love was radiant from him. And I looked at him one day, like I told you last night, I looked at him one day and I was like, I don't know, what, I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> like, he was radiant, radiant. I said, I don't know what's going on here, but I want that. Whatever this is, I want that. And he said, that's the love of Christ. I said, well, I want that. So let's do it. <laughs> and that was over 20 years ago. So in your journey, my dear friends, this area of personal witness, it's not a formula. You know, we, when we talk, when we must develop, you must develop a story that's very true, what, what Monsignor Pope was saying, very true, okay, of what God has done in our life, like where we come from, where we're going, where we're now. But and, and in that, on a much deeper level, we're also bringing the Lord into the roots of our story because, like we said, he's already there, and he's saving you in every chapter of your story. So if it's okay with you, we've got a few minutes left. Can I just pray with you? Is that okay? All right. So let me just pray with you real quick, okay? I'm just gonna ask the Lord to speak to you, okay? Because I know that you've been drinking out of a fire hose for like an hour, so I'm just gonna ask the Lord to speak to you. So I just ask you, Lord Jesus, right now, that for all of us, you would bring to mind one part of our story that you wish to speak to. I just would invite you not to censor that. I just ask you, Holy Spirit, just, Holy Spirit, bring to each one of us a part of our story that you wish to speak to. Maybe it's an area we've been trying to hide or something we don't want to think about. It's okay, you're safe here, it's okay. So just ask you, Jesus, right now, that for each one of us, would you bring to mind a part of our story that you wish to speak to?
And as you call that to your mind and to your heart, what does it feel like to even think about it? Maybe it feels heavy. Maybe it feels joyful. I don't know. But what does it feel like to even bring that part of your story to mind? And as you call to mind that part of your story, could you imagine just Christ sitting in front of you? And he is so kind. And could you just imagine him looking at you as you hold that story in your heart? His face is one of kindness and concern and compassion and attentiveness. And if you'd be willing, and only if you're willing, would you be willing to kind of, in a sense, take that story out of your heart and hold it in your hands in front of you? Just that one thing. What's the one thing? Just kind of hold that. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a memory. Maybe it's a secret. Maybe it's a hope or a dream or an ache. But would you be willing in, in, in your heart, in the silence of your heart, to kind of hold that memory in front of you in your hands? And maybe that feels scary. And what does it feel like to hold it in your hands and in front of you and look at it maybe outside for the first time? And Jesus wants to say something to you about it. So Lord Jesus, what do you want to say to each one of us right now about that? Because he loves you, because he cares where you came from and where you're going and where you are right now, and his desire is to bring you to be fully alive, if you'd be willing, Jesus would just like to gently take that from you now and place it in his own pierced heart. And if you're not ready to surrender it, that's okay. And sometimes that can be scary, but if you'd be willing, he would really like to do that for you. So could you imagine yourself just maybe opening your hands just a little wider and watching him with his pierced hands, the hands of the king or the hands of a healer, and he's going to take that from you and place it in his own heart. And if you're willing, if you would allow him to, he would like to place his divine hands on your heart. Would you let him place his hand on your heart where it's broken? In your heart where it aches or where there's deep joy, would you allow him to place his sacred and healing hand on your heart? And he's going to speak to you as he does that. So Jesus, I just ask that our hearts would be open. Please place your hand on our hearts and speak to us right now. What do you want us to know about who we are and who you are? And Lord, I pray that the heat from your hands would melt our hearts. I pray for a blessing on every single one of us right now. Lord, I pray that you would give us the courage to face the unread chapters of our story and bring them to life. I pray for healing in marriages, healing in families. Lord, I pray for hearts to be open and turn toward you. I pray for new life to be poured out upon each one of us right now. And I pray for the oil of gladness and deep courage and joy to be poured out upon us. And Lord, I pray is that you call us to be your witnesses of your goodness, of your mercy, of your fidelity, that you would write your story in every chapter of ours. That we would always find our home in you. Give us the grace to say yes to you. Just one more step today. 
And we thank you, Lord, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. My dear friends, you are deeply, deeply loved, and God is writing his beauty in your story. So all you have to do is just open your heart and say yes, just one step at a time. Thank you so much for being here. God bless you.